please subscribe to my channel. God, I'm starting to sound like Oliver Twist. Please, sir, I want some more subscribers. Ironic using that as an example, considering that looking like I do, it's obvious I could stand to miss a few visits to the gruel line. Lots of spoilers coming up. Today, Scooby-Doo meets Sandy Duncan. Visiting an actor friend at a film shoot, the gang run into a series of dangerous accidents that may halt production. Why does that sound... familiar? Famous silent film actor Zalia Z. Fairchild, presumed missing for years, had been secretly living at the Mammoth Studio movie lot. When he learned that the studio was going to be torn down to make way for a large supermarket, he decided to use sabotage... Sabotage. How? When? ...to prevent completion of the studio's final film and hopefully stop the demolition of his home. His attempts were aided by his mastery of movie disguises. This was literally the same plan Carl the Stuntman used when he tried shutting down the film he had been working on. But so much less stupid this time around. F***ing Carl the Stuntman. Fairchild was an obvious amalgam of at least three silent film actors. Douglas Fairbanks, Rudolph Valentino, who famously played a sheik, and Lon Chaney, known for his prodigious on-screen disguises. The idea of an old film star who went missing only to turn up later at the same studio in disguise would be revisited 30 years later in the What's New Scooby-Doo episode, Lights, Camera, Mayhem. I told you this video was filled with spoilers. This time around, the guest star is Sandy Duncan, playing herself as an actor starring in another film based on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Only this time, Dr. Jekyll isn't a sex pest. Hopefully. I'm sure glad they're making Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde again. Old school beer has never seen the first two movies they made of it. Actually, by the time this episode of the new Scooby-Doo movies was produced, there had already been over half a dozen silent film adaptations and three talking versions. Although the third was produced in 1960 by Hammer Films, and thus probably a bit too mature for Scooby to watch. Sandy Duncan had a prolific career in film, television, and stage, including her famous portrayal of Peter Pan in the Broadway revival of that play. I think I'm in love. Scooby thinks he's in love. And your pet fade or muted. Goodbye, everybody. As a Great Dane of that size, Scooby likely weighs around 150 pounds. Sandy Duncan is pretty strong for a petite Hollywood actor. At the time of this Scooby episode, Duncan had her own TV series, and for much of the 1970s and 80s was a television staple with numerous appearances on game shows and sitcoms, including The Hogan Family, where she took over the lead role after the network fired the original actor, Valerie Harper, for daring to ask for more money. And because someone in the comments would mention it if I didn't, Sandy Duncan reprises her role as herself decades later in an episode of Scooby-Doo and Guess Who?, Judging by how quickly I'm churning out these videos, I'll probably get to discussing that episode eventually, just as long as the caregiver at my nursing home can be trusted not to steal my camera. They're shooting on the back lot on the London Street. Now you go straight ahead to Notre Dame, you turn left at the Taj Mahal, cross the Mississippi, past Tokyo, the next left you'll be in London. The Scooby Gang eventually does visit every one of those locations in later series. Imagine tearing down a great studio like this to build a super-duper market. Once the film Sandy Duncan is working on is completed, the studio will be torn down to make way for a supermarket. However, as repeatedly shown in the episode, the studio grounds are enormous. Larger than Disney World. So just how big was that supermarket going to be? can't leave anyway till we get the mystery machine unstuck. But it isn't. Look!
The silent film era lasted until the early 1930s, meaning Fairchild was likely born no later than the turn of the century, making him easily over 70 years old. If four teenagers couldn't move a large van hanging off a bridge without contacting a towing company, how in the hell did an elderly man do it presumably by himself? In addition to running the mystery machine off the road, dialogue references accidents, presumably caused by Fairchild, including messing with the studio's electricity and setting a fire. We also see for ourselves how he later chased and tried to kill Sandy Duncan, tried to kill the gang, and, of course, kidnapped Daphne. During her abduction, the only time Daphne is actually tied up is after Fairchild brought her to the castle. So why didn't she just run away at any time before this. I should have brought you in here in the first place, Miss Duncan, but I didn't think it quite proper. I know I usually harp on how dumb it is for villains to kidnap Daphne, but at least this time the bad guy can be excused because he thought he was abducting Sandy Duncan, which was an important part of his plot. I'm stressing all the vandalism, murder attempts, and kidnapping because this is one of those Scooby episodes that end with the villain not being arrested for his crimes because everyone decided to forgive him. But he has been responsible for everything that's happened. Only because he didn't want the studio to be torn down. Nobody was really hurt. Couldn't we help him? There must be some work, something he can do. <laughs> if I was his cop, I'd be like, bullshit lady, we got called down here for a kidnapping, vandalism, and attempted murder. Also, wasn't there possible arson earlier? You may not want to press charges, but I'll bet the insurance company that's covering this film shoot is going to want a police report, if nothing else. That brings up another point. Fairchild's plan to stop the studio sale was not well thought out, considering he was under the assumption that if the film shoot was shut down, that would be enough to delay or cancel demolition. But if the movie was canceled, the insurance company would just pay up, and then the studio would still get torn down. There are we going to find another stunt girl and stand in for Sandy? Oh no, not me! <laughs> oh, Daphne, you're perfect! Then again, if the studio was okay with pressuring a teenaged girl who just happened to be visiting the set that day to be a stunt person, a job that usually requires years of training and experience, was the production even able to get insurance in the first place? In fact, why are they still filming after their lead actor is almost killed? They are knowingly putting the lives of their performers in danger. Who did Thayer and Henstone think they were? John Landis? He kidnapped Daphne because he thought she was me. Look! Stop sale of studio if you ever want to see Sandy Duncan again. Even if Fairchild had kidnapped Sandy Duncan instead of Daphne, his idea of leaving a ransom note demanding that Mammoth Studio not sell out to the developers was still ill-advised. Assuming they agreed to do this, and he released his victim, there's no reason the studio wouldn't then proceed to sell the lot anyway. Contracts under duress are not legally enforceable, particularly those involving a felony. Admittedly, Fairchild did have some success as his sabotage Sabotage? How? When? did manage to delay the film from wrapping production for an additional week, but his plan was ultimately doomed to fail and not worth the prison sentence he would normally get for destruction of property, arson, intimidation, kidnapping, and attempted murder. I'm giving Fairchild a 2 out of 5 for his design. I don't know what he could have done to prevent the sale of the studio, but it certainly wasn't what he planned in this episode. Like Big Bob Oakley and Don Knotts, the villain here was an actor who specialized in multiple disguises, including Mr. Hyde, a phantom, desert chic, mummy, two separate pirates, wolfman, briefly, bear, and Native American warrior. God damn it, more red face. Out of all those, only the Sheik and the Bear didn't already appear as villains in previous Scooby episodes. In fact, the pirates look pretty much exactly like the ghost of Redbeard's henchman, with this one wearing the same hat, earrings, mustache, armbands, tank top, sash, 
pistol, pants, and bare feet as the first henchman from the earlier episode, while the other one driving the dragon looks very similar to Redbeard's second henchman with the bandana and eye patch. The only difference was their color scheme. I'd like to think this was Hanna-Barbera trying to homage an earlier series, but I think we all know it was really them saving money by not having to design new characters, even when one of the pirates has a completely different body type than the eventual revealed villain. Fairchild gets no points for originality, and despite Sandy Duncan and the gang running from him, none of his disguises were particularly scary, with the exception of his Mr. Hyde, which was clearly inspired by Lon Chaney from London After Midnight. What he lacks in originality, though, Fairchild more than makes up for in sheer number of disguises, and while I'm not usually the sort to reward quantity over quality, a man well into his 70s who can still do all of that earns at least a 3.5 out of 5 for his outfit score. As I've said often enough, a willingness to murder is a strong indicator of a villain's determination, and Fairchild tries several times in this episode to kill, or at the very least, severely injure, those in his way. But how could it fall over by itself? Weren't you paying attention just two minutes ago when it was established that someone pulled it over with the rope that is still clearly visibly attached? The wrong prescription on your glasses can only excuse so much, Velma. Though I gave Fairchild a low score for the design of his plan, that may have unfairly focused solely on just one part of it. It should be remembered that the entire reason for his actions was to essentially save his home from being torn down. Let's take a moment to really analyze that point. Xavier C. Fairchild, one of the biggest stars of silent pictures. He's been living here all these years, Mr. Thayer, just wanting to stay in the only world he's ever known. Fairchild was a renowned silent film actor, which would put the peak of his career no later than the mid-1930s. While it's never specifically stated, it's probably safe to assume he started living secretly in the studio around that time, the assumption being that with the advent of sound pictures, a silent film star like him wouldn't be welcome in the new era. So as Sandy Duncan put it, to stay in the only world he'd ever known, he decided to essentially become a hermit squatting on the grounds of his former employer. This means for well over three decades, Fairchild had been secretly living at Mammoth Studio. Not only must he have found a place to sleep every single day where he wouldn't be discovered, Fairchild was also able to eat, bathe, use the toilet, and generally eke out a living while surrounded by hundreds of other actors and crew working at the studio most of which would likely easily recognize him if he was undisguised because at the time he disappeared, he was a very famous movie star. That would be like running into Brad Pitt hiding in the stockroom of a Walmart. Setting aside the desperate acts of sabotage, Sabotage? How? When? Fairchild enacted during the final weeks of the film shoot, everything up to that point showed a brilliant execution of his plan and a determination matched by few Scooby villains. Even after getting caught, Fairchild somehow managed to play on the sympathies of an entertainment industry executive, one of the worst examples of a greedy and heartless human being not running a social media platform, to not only avoid arrest, but also land a role in a film. The same film he was trying to get canceled. You will have my eternal gratitude, Mr. Thayer. We uh, can discuss money later. <laughs> That is the face all studio executives make when performers mention getting paid. Just ask Valerie Harbour. I'm giving Zaley Z. Fairchild a 4.5 out of 5 for the operation, because his main plot was simply to live at his old movie studio, which he successfully did for close to 40 years. His attempts to stop the film shoot and halt the sale of the studio, though ultimately unsuccessful, were just a very small part of his overall goal. This gives the elderly actor a due score of 3.3 out of 5. Thayer wants publicity. Henstone's saving money. Slats hates Duke. And with the exception of Miss Adorable here, we're really a Marvy group. Wow. Spill that tea, Shirley. Figures I'd end up in Philadelphia. This line, figures I'd end up in Philadelphia, 
seems to come out of nowhere. In my last video, I joked about Velma being in the closet, and I can't help but remember that Philadelphia had been at the center of a few gay rights incidents in the late 1960s, and its first Pride Parade took place just a few months before this episode aired. It's all white! Looks like Alaska. Yeah, none of us with fur coats. Considering older film studios sometimes use asbestos as fake snow, the cold may be the least of your worries, Daphne. <coughs> turn left. Left. Okay, okay, I'll turn left. Left. Right. King, King Kong. King Kong. He'd have to be over eighty stories high. He sure cut the Empire State Building down to size. Like the Mummy in the Addams Family episode, King Kong doesn't appear at all. In an earlier video, I mentioned a deleted scene between Batman and Velma, but that seemed to be due to fully animated footage being cut from syndication and streaming broadcasts. Here, no footage of King Kong has ever turned up, apart from the opening credits repeated in every new Scooby-Doo Movies episode. My guess would be the King Kong footage had been storyboarded and some animation cells were produced, but the scene was later scrapped, possibly due to fear of a lawsuit. The history of the copyright for King Kong is fascinating and well worth reading up on, but it basically boils down to numerous legal fights trying to determine who actually owns the property. These court battles even once included Nintendo. And while later rulings might have ended up in Hanna-Barbera's favor, they probably felt it wasn't worth the effort. Which is why when the studio decided to rip anyone off, they usually prefer to just steal from themselves. <laughs> it's only a cigar store Indian. Jesus Christ, just how common were cigar store Native American statues? This is the third time one appears in Scooby-Doo. That's where the U came from in the ransom note, and all the other words came from these. Considering the Scooby franchise's work with DC Comics over the years, it's weird they'd have Marvel Comics' most famous newspaper here. Oh, a nice Charlotte's Web reference. Hanna-Barbera released the animated version of E.B. White's book a few months after this episode aired. It should also go without saying that none of the newspaper fonts seen here match the letters on the original ransom note. On location in darkest Africa with all those real live lions and tigers and boa constrictors. To say nothing of all those alligators, wild elephants, man-eating plants, rhinoceroses. Africa doesn't have tigers. Or boa constrictors. Or alligators. <laughs> hey, Sandy Duncan is an actor. Not a zoologist. Today, Scooby Doo meets Sonny and Cher. Their day of surfing is ruined due to rain, but before the gang can turn around and head home, they meet a famous singing duo on their second honeymoon and in need of a lift. But unfortunately, the island hotel they want to book is not only run down, but also being haunted by the minions of a legendary shark god. Sonny and Cher were known for such hits as The Beat Goes On and I Got You Babe, the latter famously featured in Groundhog Day. They also had their own successful variety TV show at the time they starred in this Scooby episode, with their usual shtick involving snappy banter between the two of them, like what's seen here by their cartoon versions. You forgot the little old spare tire. No, I didn't forget it. I left it at home to make room for my little old water ski. Sonny says he left the spare at home, so what's that thing on the side of the car right next to the tire that just popped? Though divorced not long after this appearance, Sonny and Cher did occasionally reunite several times over the years. It's generally agreed that Cher achieved the most success as a solo act, while Sonny would go on to have a mediocre acting career and serve as a U.S. congressperson before dying in a skiing accident in 1998. I'm not a fan of Sonny Bono, 
but won't go into that here, as I already covered that in another Scooby video. It ought to be as plain as the nose on your face. Well, hey, nothing personal, dearest. <laughs> I love your little old big nose. Did I mention they got divorced a few years later? Now on to the villains. Milo Meekly and his two henchmen discovered a sunken Spanish galleon filled with gold doubloons. Determined to keep all the treasure for themselves, the villains decided to smuggle the gold away from the island and scare away any snoopers by dressing up as monsters serving a mythical shark god. The old legend spread by the local Indians about the Pescado Diabolico. Pescado Diabolico. That translates into fish of the devil. Pescado Diabolico actually does translate as devilfish. Good for you, Velma. Meekly and his men constructed a factory in a hidden cove under the hotel where they would smelt the doubloons and cast the gold into trash can lids so they could drive them off the island in the back of a truck. I can use these in self-defense. My uncle was first symbolist in the Marine Corps band. I'm admittedly not great at math, but by my rough estimation, if those trash can lids were made out of solid gold, one of the densest of all metals, they'd weigh close to 50 pounds each. Judging by how easily Fred is swinging them back and forth, why isn't he the one carrying the gang when they're running away from monsters instead of Velma? But antique coins are legal to keep, aren't they? But Uncle Sam would take more than half the treasure. Meekly wanted it all. It's difficult to establish which federal and state laws governing recovered treasure may have applied at the time this episode was produced, but it's fair to assume that Agent Hildago was accurate when he said Meekly and his crew would lose at least half the fortune if they reported the find to the authorities. Setting aside any legislation regarding the recovery of historical artifacts, if going by general laws regarding lost property, Meekly would have been legally required to report his find to the local police and wait a certain amount of time for any legitimate property owners to appear. In the case of treasure found in shipwrecks, it's not uncommon for the country of origin to claim ownership, complicating things even further. Even if Meekly was able to navigate the ownership issues and somehow maintain rights to all the gold, the federal taxes alone could have reduced his share by well over 50%. shower of gold slowed down the shark god. The blunt force trauma of that shower of very heavy gold didn't just slow down the shark god. It probably killed the man inside the suit. Or it would have if we weren't dealing with cartoon physics. We don't know just how much gold the ship had been carrying, but judging by how much we see on screen, it was likely one of the richest finds in treasure hunting history and worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Meekly deciding to keep his find secret and smuggle it out of the state or country was definitely worth the risk. But let's look at the villain's overall plan. A group of smugglers manage a nearby lodging establishment as a cover for their operation, while at the same time dressing up as a monster to scare away guests. Why does this sound... familiar? Yes, this was essentially the same plot used in the Snow Ghost episode, and with the exact same problem. Instead of dressing up as a monster to try and scare guests away while they secretly smelt the illegally obtained doubloons, why not just slap a close sign on the hotel door and not worry about guests in the first place? The building was already condemned, and obviously not in any shape to entertain visitors. While needlessly complicating things, I still have to give Meekly and his crew a design score of 3.5 out of 5. For the amount of money involved, this was definitely worth the risk of getting caught. Aquatic threats aren't anything new at this point for the Scooby franchise, but using one of the scariest things in the ocean as the inspiration for your monster design was a smart move. In fact, considering this episode aired two years before Peter Benchley's novel Jaws was published, Meekly was ahead of the curve when it comes to shark-themed terror. The shark men were also considered monsters and not ghosts, thus avoiding the need for any added special effects. Appearance-wise, they're definitely intimidating, because of course they are. Sharks are terrifying. The only way they could have been more frightening would be if the producers had used goblin sharks as the model. Goblin sharks are what make the space kook wake up at night covered in sweat. 
The suits also incorporate full scuba gear, making the design extremely practical as well. As mentioned in the Captain Cutler episode, any costume that can also be used for a quick ocean getaway should the authorities close in earns full marks. The shark men get a 5 out of 5 for their outfits. Originality earns high points. Scariness earns high points. Practicality earns high points. Meekly and his henchmen really drop the ball when it comes to implementing their plans. I've already mentioned that keeping the condemned hotel open was a mistake, but that was only the first of many. Anyone get his license number? No, but I'd recognize that dirty laugh anywhere. Sonny Bono, singer, actor, politician, amazing ventriloquist. Not even his mustache moved when delivering that line. Trying to run the mystery machine off the road was not only pointless and reckless, but it stupidly put the gang on alert for possible danger. That's not to mention that the villain's truck was carrying their smuggled goods. Going by how loudly the henchman was laughing as he drove by, this was an intentional malicious act. Is it worth the possible discovery of your scheme just to screw with some teenagers? Remember, most traffic accidents end up involving a police report at some point. Setting that aside, had the vehicles collided, it's more than likely that one or both might have gone into the water. The smuggler's truck was carrying solid gold trash can lids, meaning the entire thing had to be extremely heavy. If the truck went over the side, it was going to sink straight to the bottom of the ocean. Yes, Meekly and his men had the equipment to salvage it, obviously, but that would add so much more unnecessary time to the operation, and the longer they took to smuggle the gold, the greater the chances of getting caught. When you say hotel staff, where's the rest of it? Oh, you made her in a mite. Matilda, she's over there in the shadows. Sizing you folks up right now. All of you shark men out of the water and back to the hotel on the double. This is Matt Hildago, your friendly neighborhood investigative agent speaking. Why were you in disguise? A male agent would have made Captain Meekly suspicious. That's why Matilda applied for a job as chambermaid. If using the condemned hotel as cover for a smuggling operation was the only reason Meekly was keeping it open, and he had no intention of having any guests, why would he hire housekeeping staff? It doesn't matter if the cleaner was a man or a woman. Why run the risk of getting caught by inviting unnecessary witnesses? Or if the cover was so important, why didn't he just hire another henchman or two from wherever he got the guys wearing the shark costumes? You can't leave right now. Why not? Condition of the main road. Wow! The road to the mainland is under two fathoms of ocean. Someone must have left the water running last night. This time of year, you can only get back to the mainland at mean low tide. And when is the exact time of the next mean low tide? 2.27. Next Tuesday. If Meekly knew the tide would be coming in and would make leaving the island impossible, why didn't he simply tell the unwanted guests that was going to happen? Why bother with shark outfits and creepy noises when he simply could have said, Sorry kids, but you don't want to stay here right now. The tide's coming in soon, and if you don't leave right away, you're going to be stranded on this island for a week. Sonny and Cher might be okay with that as they were planning on staying at the hotel for their second honeymoon, but the gang had only set out that morning for a single day of surfing. So surely they would have found that very inconvenient. Don't call me Shirley. Not everything Meekly and his henchmen did was dumb. They should get credit for constructing a surprisingly well-equipped smelting factory in the hidden cove under the hotel, as well as the brilliant mechanism they used to create the illusion of shark fins circling the island. We caught on to it when one of his shark men tried to spend a few doubloons in town. But of course, none of that matters if one of your henchmen was stupid enough to try passing gold doubloons while visiting local merchants, and thus alerting the authorities that something was up. This guy's probably wondering why so many people are trying to buy his hamburgers with weird gold coins. Your henchmen are also inept if they obey a single presumably unarmed law enforcement official to stop what they're doing and return to the hotel so they can be arrested. Dummies, you're wearing scuba gear. Just swim away and leave your boss behind to take the heat. You've clearly been smuggling gold for some time now and should have made enough to comfortably skip the country. 
Or, you know, there's three of you. Just overpower the agent. He doesn't exactly have a boxer's physique. Considering you were comfortable trying to kill the gang and two famous TV stars, making one investigator disappear shouldn't be that difficult. You don't even need to kill him. Just keep him and the rest tied up while you finish stealing the gold. You've even got an ocean vessel that would allow you to leave the island with whatever leftover loot you could carry. But no, Meekly and his men simply surrendered and are now presumably sharing a cell somewhere with Tommy Thompson. The mechanical floating shark fins and hidden smelting plant do not outweigh the many stupid mistakes made by Meekly and his henchmen. So they're getting a 1.5 out of 5 for their operation. The phony hotel manager and his shark men get a do score of 3.3 out of 5. Don't worry, I'll have this little old top up any minute. This has nothing to do with the episode, but I drive a convertible, and this has happened to me. It does suck trying to raise a broken top like that, especially in the rain. We just spread the monogram on your door. Sonny Bono and Mrs. Sonny Bono. No, Velma. That's Sonny Bono. This is Bono. 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 What are you doing here, Cher? Drowning. While we're on the subject of mispronunciation, I did almost make fun of how Cher says drowning here with a second D sound in the middle instead of drowning. But apparently drowning is acceptable on a Scrabble board, so who am I to argue with Hasbro? I mean... They gave us G.I. Joe. Must be an unusually high tide. Someone tell me when we get there. I'm a little chicken. Where the hell is the rest of the mystery machine? Let me see that color photograph of this hotel again. Oh, no. If that's it up ahead, this hotel brochure speaks with a forked tongue. Back in the 1990s, I worked as a desk clerk for a local chain hotel that rhymes with Schmalade Schmin, and one of the things management made us do on nights when we were booked solid was try and help walk-in customers find a room somewhere else in town. When that happened, there was only ever one motel in the entire county that always had rooms free because it made the hotel scene in this episode look like the Ritz-Carlton. Despite a third of that motel having burned down years earlier and not rebuilt, the owner of the place used photos from the 1960s in all his print advertising, including pictures of a gorgeous blue pool that no longer existed. I had people drive back to my hotel to yell at me for having suggested that place to them. So the moral of the story is never go on a long trip without making reservations because you don't always know where you might end up. Hey, the desk! It's swinging! It's the only thing around here that does. In the 1960s, the word swinging meant lively, exciting, fashionable. In the 1970s, however, when this episode aired, swinging meant something completely different. Did I mention Sonny and Cher divorced a few years after this episode aired? Look, look! That little elevator we rode in last night! Yeah! If we're gonna get to the bottom of this mystery, we might as well start in the cellar! They must have taken that elevator when they were running from King Kong, because that's the only time this dumbwaiter appears in the episode. All kidding aside, there was probably yet another deleted scene or script change the producers made, and they didn't adjust later dialogue to account for the cut. That bucket crane operator sees us! Back when this episode aired, television was not high definition, and even the best broadcast images were often fuzzy. So perhaps kids watching this in the 1970s wouldn't have been able to see that it was obviously meekly at the controls. Why would the Hanna-Barbera animators, notorious for production mistakes and off-model drawings, bother rendering the villain as clearly as they did here before the unmasking? Sure, they had no idea viewers 40 years later would be able to get a crystal clear image, but just the fact they drew meekly so sharply outside of his disguise is baffling. If you stood in a draft, you'd twang. Well, don't worry. Nothing's gonna happen to you while I'm around. I know. No one has to know you're impotent. Don't say that word! And that's my ranking of the villains from the fourth set of episodes of the new Scooby-Doo movies, shown here along with the ones from my previous videos. 
It's funny how both bad guys featured this time around ended up with the same do score, but varied quite a bit when it came to the numbers assigned to the three component rankings. Particularly how Fairchild's operation score brought his average up, while Meekly's brought it down. Hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I already did my begging for subscribers at the beginning, so I'll spare you that now.